much text new to the number that you see on the screen? Well, Johnny, I have my popcorn and I am ready for God in the movies. Uh, if you don't mind me asking, what's your favorite movie snack? Well, my favorite candy is Skittles. Okay. Anybody else? Skittles, yeah. But my favorite snack while I'm watching a movie uh -huh. is popcorn, but not just, not just popcorn. It's like when you go to the movies and they put popcorn, yep. then butter. Yep. Popcorn, butter. Popcorn, oh, butter, you man. know, you gotta have all the butter. Oh man. So, so good. What about you? What's your favorite? I, I have to agree. I, I try all these hacks to eat before I go to the movies, but every time I walk in, the smell of popcorn, oh, so yeah. it has to be popcorn. It smelled like that out there. It was amazing. Oh yeah. I love going to the movies, but um, I also love watching award shows. Do you okay. like watching award yep. shows? Um, and since, since we have the tuxes, yep. since we have the mics yep. right now, yep. since we have the stage, yep. I thought today we could try out something that I've always wanted to do, okay. announce the winner of an award. Okay. Anybody else wanted to do that? You just wanted to let me, rip open the envelope? Yeah, so let me thought, hold your So just for fun, okay. I thought that we could do that today. So are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Let's go. The winner okay. of the best guitarist goes to... Mr. P. Fedeplay. Oh, yeah, come on. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Get your award, bro. Congratulations. Congratulations. Give it up for Pete, everybody. Oh, good. Well, Johnny, that was fun, but we need to get going with our service. So let's all stand if you're able to, and let's sing together. Come on, let's go.
have been saved by the grace of God amen I have been raised to a future without end I set my eyes on a true and loyal friend the one whose life I'm hidden would you remind us of the greatest rescue mission that the world would ever experience. God, we thank you so much for what you've already done. We're excited for what you have next for us, God. And all God's people said, amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Welcome, welcome to Eastern Hills and welcome to God in the movie. Yeah, I love your tuxedo, by the way. They don't realize these are just t-shirts, so it's all good. (laughs) Great, thanks. You just... (laughs) Thanks, Johnny. They didn't hear it. As you can tell, we don't take ourselves too serious yeah, around yeah, here. Yeah. <laughs> if this is your first time and you're new to Eastern Hills, welcome. You've picked a fantastic weekend to be yes. here, and we would love to help you get connected 
If you don't mind, please text the word NEW to the number that's on your screen. Yeah. And today, whether this is your very first time on our campus, or even if you've been here a while, we want to invite you to Backstage Pass. So right after the service, you can meet us right down here in the front of the auditorium, and you'll have a chance to tour our building and some of the ministry environments around here. And it's a great chance to meet some of our staff, some volunteers, and some other folks who are checking out Eastern yep. Hills. Yep. You know, Johnny, over the last few weeks, we've had some amazing time at our Table for Eights. I don't know, but it's been so, so, so good. It's an opportunity for you to get to know Tom and Jess a little bit more. Time for you to ask them questions, learn a little bit more about Eastern Hills, and have some incredible fun at the same time. We want to let you know that there's going to be at least one more on yes. April the 16th. So if you haven't had a chance to sign up, go to ehills.org slash weekend and register. Yeah, it's been so good. Well, um, I don't know about the rest of you, but as for the two of us, we're still thinking about yeah. last weekend Easter and the 5,600 wow. people Come on, let's give it up. that stepped onto our campus for Easter services. That is something wow. to celebrate. It's been amazing, yeah. amazing, amazing. And it's your generosity that makes things like Easter happen and allow this place to be a place where you can invite your friends and your neighbors to attend. And so I would like to invite you to become part of the generous community here at Eastern Hills by going to ehills.org slash weekend and clicking on the give button right there. Your generosity is making an impact on our community. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that. Thank you for being a part of that. Welcome to week one of God in the Movies. Rescue teams are working through the night to save 12 boys and their coach trapped inside a cave. The monsoon had come early. The conditions in the cave were impossible. There was a very strong feeling that the children couldn't be still alive. We need expert cave divers out here. The Thai Navy SEALs put everything they had into it but only this group of people who do it as a weekend hobby has those skills. I was thinking this, this has actually got our name all over it. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face, trying to wriggle through holes that I couldn't wriggle through, finding a bigger space, sliding through, and then repeating again and again. We look into each other's faces thinking we may be the only ones that ever see them. Finding the boys was the easy part. They didn't have a clue how to get those kids up. We didn't think it was possible to dive the children out. We came up with the actual logistical plan. I told him that's a horrible idea. And then Rick said, what if it's the only idea? We were brutally honest. We promised multiple fatalities. It's about controlling your emotions and your fear. Panic is death in the cave. My mind was on overdrive. Oh my God, am I going to be good enough? If they die, it's going to tear me apart. If you don't die, everyone will die. I told the guys, this is a one-way trip. Once you start, you cannot stop. Believe. <laughs> I've watched that film so many times and uh, I've cried so many times watching the film. For those of you who've seen it, even just preparing for this message. But uh, welcome. My name is Tom. I'm one of the pastors here. Welcome to God in the Movies. And I'm going to get straight into the movie for today, and we're going to talk a little bit about why we do it. But The Rescue is a 2021 film that chronicles the enthralling, against all odds, true story that transfixed the world back in 2018. The daring rescue of 12 boys and their coach from deep inside a flooded cave in northern Thailand. Uh, what happened was the boys had gone into the cave system after a soccer match, which they'd done many times before, but this time the monsoon rains came early and began flooding the chambers of the cave, forcing them deeper and deeper inside the cave system. 
And just to give you an idea of the, 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 the scale of this thing, I mean, there you can see just a kind of a diagram of where they found the kids four kilometers into the cave system. That is two and a half miles deep. Um, I kind of measured it on Google Maps. That is from here, from this building to the other side, the opposite side of the Aurora Reservoir, underwater, underground, and under a mountain. <laughs> At first, the Thai Navy SEALs were sent in, but the conditions were so dangerous, so impossible, that they just couldn't get very far into the cave system, and uh, uh, let alone find out whether the boys were even alive. And these guys were incredibly brave. They went in without any regard for their own safety, and they really didn't have the necessary cave diving equipment, but they still went in regardless. In fact, in the first few days, one of those Thai Navy SEALs tragically died trying to find the boys in the cave. And then after six or seven days, people began to lose hope. The monsoon rains kept falling mercilessly and most people assumed that there was just no way that those kids could still be alive. I mean, think about it. These boys were aged between 11 and 16. My youngest son is about to turn 11, and I can't even begin to imagine what that must be like, the panic of my little boy being stuck in the dark without food, without, without anything for seven days, not knowing whether people even knew they were there or whether they would ever be rescued. Can you imagine the fear? Now, I want to press pause on that story for a while. It really is. We're going to come back to it because it really is just one of the most heroic, perilous, and extraordinary rescue missions of modern day time. But I want to press pause and talk a little bit about why we do God in the movies, why we're doing this series. Because maybe this is your first time here or you came on Easter and now you're back to check things out and maybe you're even asking the question. I've already had people ask, why are we talking about movies in church? Shouldn't we be talking about the Bible? <laughs> And the answer is yes, but here's the deal. We believe in the power of a story, that there's something powerful about a good story that is moving and attractive and inspirational that can speak deeply to our hearts. It's why the Hollywood box office generates more than $10 billion a year. It's why we cry or we laugh when we watch good movies. It's why there's no culture in the world where parents don't tell their kids stories. There's something about a powerful story that sticks in our mind. And here's the connection. We believe that God is the ultimate storyteller, right? And it's why Jesus so often used parables or stories in his teaching. It's why when the disciples asked Jesus in Matthew 13, they says, why do you tell stories? And Jesus responded, he says, because it creates readiness in people's hearts. It nudges them towards receptive insight, towards seeing a bigger truth. And so Jesus, he would, when he was teaching on the Sermon on the Mountain, wherever he was, he would look around and he would see a person sowing seeds or he would see a fig tree and he would use what the people saw around them to highlight a universal truth, a biblical truth, a God truth about life. It was something that was usually real and tangible and it was a relevant metaphor for the listeners of the day. And so in many ways, that is why we do a series like God in the Movies, to identify truth, God's truth, biblical truth, in the stories that we see around us, to find God all around us, and sometimes to find God in unexpected places. Are you with me? Yeah. Okay, so let's dive into the story of the rescue. And before, we, that's probably not the best language. Let's, <laughs> let's look at the story, okay? But... And I, and I don't want to trivialize what these boys went through, but here's the question I want to ask you today. In your own life, what cave do you find yourself in? Hopefully, it's not nearly as desperate or traumatic as the situation that these 13 people found themselves in, but the reality is for all of us, if we're honest, at some point in our lives, we will find ourselves in a dark place. Perhaps it's crippling depression or anxiety that holds you, strangles you. Perhaps it's a divorce or a relational breakdown or a tension you cannot resolve. Perhaps an addiction or a sin that holds you captive, trapped in the dark. Or maybe you're here, you're not in a cave right now. It feels like, hey, things are going well for you. Listen still, because here's the reality. At some point, you will be. Because that's just how life works. 
In the scriptures, there are many, many accounts of biblical characters found trapped or hiding in caves. You may be familiar with some of them. From David hiding from Saul in the cave of Adullam, where he wrote most of the Psalms, to Elijah hiding in a cave on the run from the the, the Queen Jezebel. Um, But not just literal caves, we also see metaphorical caves in the scriptures. Listen to the prophet Isaiah as he's speaking to, he's describing the state of the nation in Isaiah 42. And the context is that the people of Israel were in exile. They were broken, they were disappointed, they'd been removed from their homeland and things had not turned out the way they thought they would. Can anyone relate? (laughs) They were suffering, they were in pain and Isaiah identifies with the people and he says this, He says, but this is a people plundered and despoiled. All of them are trapped in caves or are hidden away in prisons. They have become prey with none to deliver them and a spoil with none to say, give them back. They become trapped in caves. And so here's the question I wanna again pose to you. What cave do you find yourself in today? What fears haunt your heart? What keeps you up at night? What, 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 does it feel like maybe you're all alone and no one's coming to rescue you? You've tried and tried and failed. Maybe if you're honest, you're even asking the question, God, where are you? Where are you in this? Why aren't you hearing my prayers? You know, it's easy to endure a difficult situation if we know that the season is coming to an end, right? But what if we don't know? I mean, these kids didn't know if they were gonna get out. And maybe there's some of you in the room today or watching online and you're wondering the same thing. You're wondering, how long, Lord? How long is this gonna keep going on? And you may say, God, I don't mind waiting. I just need to know that you're working, that something is happening, that I'm not gonna be in this situation, in this relationship, in this, whatever this is, in this pain forever. But here's the thing, I think that the the story can teach us from the cave is that we who follow Jesus, we do not walk by sight, but by faith, amen? And so then the question becomes, will you keep waiting? Will you keep trusting, even when it seems like nothing is working? That is a question of faith. Will you believe that God is moving even when you are not? I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. I want to get back to the story because I believe there are lessons packed into this film, into this true life story that I think we can learn from this rescue operation to not only help us endure the the cave seasons or the difficult seasons in our lives, but also understand the way in which God, our heavenly father, seeks to rescue us and uses us to rescue others. Are you ready? So let's take a look at the first clip. Take a look. It has been seven days since this team of 12 Thai boys and their football coach has been missing in this vast cave complex. Water levels in the cave have been rising, going up overnight by six inches every hour. High water levels have made the search very challenging, but divers use huge pumps to reduce some of that water. The volunteers have been traveling to northern Thailand to help with the rescue operation. This has become really a worldwide rescue effort. Volunteers from Europe, Australia, Asia, and the U.S. The reason I wanted to show you that clip is that one of the most remarkable things about the story is it wasn't just the Thai Navy or the Royal Army or the British or the Australian divers. In fact, it was an entire army of civilians and volunteers who came from around the world to lend a hand and do whatever they could. In fact, they, reckon, they, they, they kind of uh, estimated that it, when it was all over, there were over 5,000 volunteers that participated in helping the boys get out. 5,000. Johnny just mentioned now, we had over 5,000 people attending our services uh, on Easter. What a, isn't that cool? What a celebration. But imagine all 5,000 of those people traveling around the world to go help get these 12 boys out. 
There were people making food for the volunteers. There were people carrying supplies. There were people digging, people putting up tents, people praying. There were engineers trying to figure out how to redirect the water. That was a whole other engineering feat on its own. The, the point is this, that this rescue was far, than just a, far more than just a story about a few heroes. It's a story about our shared humanity of the international community that united to save these boys. It's about the power of community when we come together to solve problems. And that is my first point, that God uses community to rescue us. That God uses community to rescue you and me. You see, cl climbing out of your cave, climbing out of an addiction or out of a, a difficult season or a depression or whatever darkness you may be in, it is never a solo mission. It is never a solo mission. And the Christian life is not an individual sport. Oh, I'm spitting everywhere. Yes. <laughs> That's why they don't put the chairs so far for it. <laughs> it's not a solo mission. You know, I've heard this many times before, but people have said to me, you know, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. And I'm like, of course you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. I mean, yeah, obviously, that's like saying, just like you don't have, to, you know, just like standing in your garage doesn't make you a car. Okay, coming to church doesn't make you a Christian. But, that, but imagine using that same argument with other things in the Bible, like forgiving people doesn't make me a Christian, so I'm not gonna do that. Loving my enemies doesn't make me a Christian, so I'm not gonna bother with that. No, ultimately only one thing makes us a Christian, and that's our belief in and relationship with Jesus Christ, amen? But that doesn't mean our salvation isn't dependent on our church attendance, thank God, but that doesn't mean that being part of a church community or attending church is irrelevant. We do it because God tells us to do it. And if a good and loving father is telling us to do something, then it must be good for us. It must mean that there's something in our makeup that makes us, that we're wired for connection, wired for community. And so yes, while going to church doesn't make you a Christian, it can certainly help you to become a better one. <laughs> Right? I mean, we say JMLB, Jesus makes life better. I'm gonna add something to that. CMYB, church makes you better. <laughs> At least one person thought it was funny. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> My point is, whatever you're going through, whatever you're going through, don't do it alone. Don't do it alone. We live in this individual society. We, we tend to, when we're struggling, we kind of go to ourselves. But maybe God is bringing people into your life to rescue you, <laughs> to comfort you, to show you compassion, to speak truth to you, even if sometimes that truth may be hard to hear. And sadly, so often we miss that. We're waiting for God to display His deliverance in some dramatic fashion, when actually maybe it's just through the simple encouragement of another person, right? Right? I mean, it's a famous old parable. I'm not even sure if I should tell it because you've probably heard it before. But it's the whole story of the guy who's caught in the storm, you know, in the, 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 the small town and it starts to rain and rain and rain. And as the waters rise, the man is kneeling on his front porch surrounded by the water and a guy comes up the, the street in a canoe, you know, get in. And he says, no, no, my God will save me. And then of course the waters rise and eventually he's on his balcony and someone comes by in a motorboat and says, get in. You know, the dam's about to burst. No, no, my God will rescue me. I shall remain. The Lord will see me through, right? After a while, of course, the dam breaks, the waters rise, now he's on top of the roof and through the clouds, a helicopter comes down. The soldier says, hey man, this is your last chance. Get, you know, reach out, grab the ladder. The guy says, no, no, my God will deliver me. And of course, we know the story. He drowns, goes to heaven, says, God, I was faithful to you. Why didn't you deliver me? And God's like, dude, <laughs> what more do you want from me? I sent you two boats and a helicopter, okay? <laughs> Now, I know it's cheesy and maybe you've heard it before, but it's kind of true. It's true. And I believe that right now, God is bringing people into your life that you need and that need you. So don't miss it. Don't think that you can do this on your own, grab hold of that helping hand, swallow your pride, see a counselor, get help, ask for help, tell someone about your secret, bring it out into the light, or if, you, if it's in your power, lend a helping hand, get stuck in, and instead of complaining or, con or criticizing, we're so good at that, 
Rather do something, volunteer, give, serve, get involved. We're all in this together. God uses community for his rescue mission. Okay, next clip, next point. This one needs a little bit of a setup. You see, pretty early on, and especially after the death of that Thai Navy SEAL, I, when, my, when I did the practice, I said just the Navy SEAL, and someone said, you have to say Thai Navy SEAL, because it's not, I said, you guys aren't the only ones with Navy SEALs, okay. <laughs> After the death, they realized that they just didn't have the specialized cave diving equipment that they needed. And in the end, the best people qualified for the job were these kind of random, to be honest, awkward people. <laughs> these British and Australian guys who were like, during the day, they were, you know, their, their jobs were IT and consultants and electricians by day, but they also happened to be these cave diving hobbyists on the weekend. So let me introduce you today to the world's most unlikely rescue team. Take a look. It takes a peculiar type of person to be a cave diving explorer. What makes someone want to be an explorer? I think it's two parts ego, one part curiosity, one part... Um, um, lack of confidence in yourself and the need to prove yourself. You know, maybe I was no good at footy and cricket, but at least I can, you know, cave dive quite well. I think it's fair to say all of us were not team players. None of us are very good with ball skills. I was a loser. I'm terrible at team sports. <laughs> I think doesn't play well with others is a phrase that you're looking for. I was quiet and shy and didn't like confrontation. I wasn't so sociable. I was bullied a bit as a teenager, yeah, because I was a little bit different. I've got a lazy left eye, <laughs> which, when I was younger, actually pointed in the wrong direction, <laughs> which uh, it's quite funny looking back on it, because uh, it, um, it was quite a big part of my, my life at the time. Like, it was quite self... Um, I was quite self-conscious about it, you know. Kids are mean. <laughs> There's no question that in my younger years, I started off perhaps emotionally challenged. Yeah, I wasn't the most social person. A bit of bullying at school and stuff, but the worst people I've blocked out of my mind. But once I get underground, I, that, that all disappears. Can't see anything. Just my bubbles, isolated. This is a place where I kind of feel comfortable and feel like I uh, feel safe. <laughs> Quiet and peace. Get away from everything in normal society. Back to the age of the caveman. <laughs> it comes back to that kind of ability to expand your comfort zone. But probably some people's worst nightmares. It's about controlling your emotions and your fear. Because panic is death in the cave. Mm. <laughs> Anyone feeling claustrophobic? <laughs> I mean, you can see these guys were uncommon people. A bit awkward, nerds, outcasts, they were bullied. But here's my point. When it comes to God, God's rescue mission for humanity, God uses unlikely people. <laughs> God uses unlikely people like Rick and John and you and me. <laughs> Not just SEAL teams and professionals, just everyday, ordinary people. And so let me say this. Don't think for a minute that God cannot use you. Don't think for a minute, God cannot use you. You may feel unqualified. You may feel like an imposter. I mean, I feel like that every time I get up here on the stage. You may feel unworthy, but God specializes in using people just like that to fulfill his purposes. I mean, just think about the Bible. Read through the Bible. Noah was a drunkard. Abraham was an old man. Moses had a stutter. Rahab was a prostitute. David was a murderer. Matthew was a despised tax collector. 
I could go on and on and on. And God can take our lives, all of our lives, the good and even the bad, and use it for his plans. I mean, these guys did this as a weekend hobby. And yet, I mean, the one guy said, Wait, how do you feel in the cave? I feel safe. Are you crazy? <laughs> they were perfectly built for this rescue mission. They knew what it was like to be dark underwater. They actually enjoyed it. And so E Hills, could it be, could it be that in your own life, that the darkness, the, the pain that you've been through, the struggles that you've dealt with, that you've overcome, could it be that it has all been preparation for the mission and the purpose that God has called you to? Could it be? Because what I've found is that often the best people equipped to help, for example, addicts overcome addiction are those who've walked through addiction. <laughs> The best people to help people, those who've lost a child or others who've lost a child who understand that grief and that pain. And we have support groups, 12-step groups and grief groups because of that reason. Here's the thing. God wants to use you for his grand rescue plan. And it's not just to save 13 lives in a cave. It's to save all of humanity back to himself. And so maybe you're in a place and you feel like you need rescue right now. Or maybe God is calling you to rescue others. And you don't have to fly halfway around the world to find people in need of rescuing. Hello? I'm talking about your neighbors. I'm talking about your family members. I'm talking about your colleagues who sit next to you. And maybe all they need to be saved, to be rescued, is a simple invite to church. Or maybe a phone call just to say you're thinking of them or a meal delivered to their home. Make no mistake, you have a specific set of skills. You have a circle of influence. You have gifts and abilities and personality and a history that has perfectly positioned you to do what God has called you to do. You have everything you need to do what God is asking you to do right now. Will you hear the call? Will you step up? Will you join him in his mission to bring healing and hope to a broken world? Final point, not the final clip, but the final point is this. God uses community. God uses unlikely people. And God never gives up. God never gives up. You see, there was a point in this story where the divers actually gave up. It just seemed hopeless. It felt completely Hopeless. Take a look. We essentially agreed that the conditions in the cave were impossible. The monsoon had come early and it wasn't going to let up for many months. very strong feeling that the children couldn't be still alive. It just didn't, it didn't seem possible. We lost hope. feel the pain of a mother wanting his son, wanting her son. That was day eight. Say day eight. You know what I've come to realize? When it comes to doing hard things, when it comes to climbing out of the caves of our own lives or helping others out of theirs, is that all of us eventually have a day eight where it feels like it's just too much. I can't do this anymore, I'm not good enough, I don't have what it takes, we all lose hope. And maybe that's exactly where you are right now. But I wanna remind you, E Hills, of this truth, that God never gives up on us. Even when we give up, he never gives up on us. He has not forsaken you. The Bible says that he never leaves us nor forsakes us. He knows where you are. He knows your situation. And he will stop at nothing to rescue you. There is, in fact, no cave too deep, no darkness too great that he cannot rescue you from. Amen? I've seen him do it a thousand times in my own life and in the lives of others. 
So I wanna encourage you, whatever you might be going through right now, do not give up, do not lose hope. Thankfully, those divers resolved to keep trying. Day nine, day 10, can you imagine? 10 days, these small boys were in the cave without food. But then, on day 10, say day 10, on day 10, John, one of the lead divers, had what he describes as a powerful feeling to keep pushing deeper into the caves. Now, you can take that as you want. (laughs) I don't know if John is a Christian or not, but my sense, I believe, I'm absolutely convinced that that powerful feeling was the Spirit of God prompting John to keep going. And this is what happened next. I was getting quite keen to turn around because I was way beyond any sensible air margin. Rule number one, use a third of your air on the way in, a third on the way out, and you keep a third for spare. But I just had this powerful feeling that it just that it, it was time to push. It, it, it was the right time to push. So we continue upstream, trying to follow the flow. Instantaneous, a pungent smell, silence. We both assumed we were smelling decomposing bodies. There's something unpleasant here. And then suddenly I saw a light flash. John immediately got out of the camera. Yeah, press your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How, how many of you? 13? Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Believe. Believe. On the audio, there's me saying, believe. That was me trying to tell me this is real. This is actually happening. Back at you, please, by your side. No, not today. Not today. You have to go. We are coming. It's okay. Okay. We'll see you soon. As we left, pretty much all of them came and hugged us individually. I made them a promise that I would come back. I am really happy. We, we are happy too. Thank you so much. Okay. So, where you come home? England, UK. Oh. As we went round the corner and kitted up, total silence between me and John, just a look into each other's faces, thinking we may be the only ones that ever see them. That was a distinct possibility. The whole journey back, All I was thinking was, what on earth are we going to do now? I'm not crying, you're crying. (laughs) (laughs) Believe, believe. The boys have been found. There was a massive celebration that rippled across the world. The problem was that finding the boys was the easy part. No one had a clue how to get them out. Earlier in the rescue operation, the divers had taken four cave workers out with oxygen bottles and dive masks, and it was a complete disaster. The men nearly struggled, and they, they struggled. They nearly drowned, panicking underwater, and that had been a 30-second underwater swim. These kids were more than three hours of cave diving away from the entrance. 
There was just no way. Options included waiting out the monsoon season, sending in food and supplies for a possible eight months, hoping that the cave wouldn't completely flood. Another option was con they considered was drilling a tunnel from the top of the mountain down into the cave. Elon Musk even got involved, but that proved impossible. They were literally under a mountain. But then Rick, one of the divers, thought of an idea, and he, he contacted his cave diving friend, Richard Harris, in Australia, who was also an anesthetist. And, and when I said that word in the run-through, they said, that's not how you say it. And I said, you're wrong. Um, <laughs> Okay, so the doctor who puts people to sleep, okay? You know who I'm talking about, but <laughs> Rick asked this anesthetist if it was possible to anesthetize the kids. <laughs> and he said, it's impossible. Absolutely not. In fact, his exact words were, I could think of a hundred ways a child could die very quickly. For example, if the mask leaked even a little bit, the kids would simply, they were under sedation, they would swallow the water and drown. If, if, if their heads fell forward in any way during the dive, their airway could be obstructed and they would die. On and on, it just, it just wasn't an option until it was the only option. Many people said it couldn't be done, but Rick was determined. What if it could? In fact, he said this, he says, if we dive, some may die. If we don't dive, everyone will die. And so they decided to do it. The air in the cave was running out. The water levels was continuing to rise. The monsoon was looming and the clock was ticking. Day 11, day 12, this had never been done before. Day 13, day 14, the logistics were immense. Day 15, day 16, now the Thai Navy SEALs pulled back. There was a disagreement on whether they thought this was possible and even ethical. Now the responsibility lay squarely on the shoulders of these hobbyist cave divers. Body bags were prepared for the children and they even had an escape route to the airport in case all of the children died and the locals turned on the divers. Finally, everything was ready. Day 17, say day 17. Think about that, nearly three weeks after these boys had entered the cave. And just a little side note for you, if you might find yourself in your own cave today. How many of you know God's timing is not always our timing? The key is not to lose hope in the waiting. See, God may not get you out on the day you wanted, but he will get you out. It's known as the Stockdale Paradox, the ability to face the brutal facts of today without ever losing hope for the future. And I'm speaking to someone here today. Day 17, they did it. They did it. I don't wanna give away the whole story. You can go watch it, but they did it. It took more than three more days, but they eventually got all 12 of those boys and their coach out completely unharmed. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? I think, I mean, this is years ago, but we can still clap. <laughs> As one cave diver reflected, he says, make no mistake, this rescue mission was nothing short of putting a man on the moon. It was literally a miracle. In fact, that word got used a lot in the media over the next couple days. Miracle upon miracle upon miracle, they said. Check out this last clip. Mission impossible. Even though we were the sort of spearheads of this operation, there were hundreds and hundreds of people in that cave. อาจจะมีขัดแย้งกันบ้างแต่ท้ายที่สุดแล้วขอเพียงมีใจที่เป็นจิตอาสาแล้วครับแล้วก็มีทักษะที่เรารวบรวมกันขึ้นมาก็จ
you know. Thank you so much. Miracle piled upon miracle. I hold a sort of great pride in what what we did. You could say justification for the dedication I put forward into a ridiculous minority sport that no one ever took seriously. Yes, it's definitely changed my life. It made me into maybe a more confident person. Last to be chosen for the cricket team, first to be chosen for the cave rescue. <laughs> what did you used to worry? Was, was I a bit too cold? Was I a bit too unemotional? I found a use and a purpose to that level of detachment. You can use it to, to do good things. The way is more. He said, you, you need to marry Em. <laughs> and they did get married. <laughs> miracle upon miracle upon miracle. And you know the crazy thing about the story is? Just a few days after they rescued the boys out of that cave, the cave became completely submerged underwater. And it was eight months before that cave became accessible again. I'm telling you, Eels, God uses community. God uses unlikely people. And God, our God, never gives up, never. And you may feel like today you're in an impossible situation, but nothing is impossible for Him. He has been called the hound of heaven, the one who never stops searching for us. And right now, there is an all out search. So I wanna close by reading to you Isaiah 43. Remember, we started by reading Isaiah 42, where, 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 Isaiah, where God describes the people of Israel trapped in caves. But look at what Isaiah says in the next chapter. And I must tell you, when I first read this, I was totally, it took my breath away. I couldn't believe it. And in the end, this is really the message that I feel God has placed on my heart to tell you today. And that is this, Isaiah 43, verse one says, Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, those kids pass through waters. He says, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. The message translation says this, do not be afraid, I have redeemed you. I've called your name, you're mine. And when you're in over your head, I'll be there with you. When you're in rough waters, you will, you will not go down. When you're between a rock and a hard place, how many of you feel like that? God says it won't be a dead end. Why? Because I am your God, your personal God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior, and I paid a huge price for you. You see, friends, here's the whole point of the whole message. The huge price God paid for you and for me is Jesus Christ. And when all is said and done, Jesus Christ is the great rescuer. 
He was and still is God's plan, His great rescue plan for all of humanity. And this movie may be good, and this story may be remarkable, but it is merely a glimpse of who our God is, the great rescuer. So we don't have to stay trapped in caves, trapped in cycles of sin or depression or anxiety or anger or anything else that would rob us of the life that Jesus paid a price for. Jesus says, I've come to set the captives free. And guess what? He was the most unlikely hero of all. (laughs) We spoke about this on Easter last week. Jesus didn't have an army. He wasn't a professional. He was born in a manger and came riding in on a donkey, but God used him. When the disciples said it was impossible, thought it was all over, gave up and went back to fishing. But on the third day, Jesus walked out of that tomb. Amen. Do you get it? Jesus walked out of the cave. He came out of the darkness of death to rescue us, to redeem us, to give us life. And maybe you feel like this season has knocked the wind out of you and you're gasping for air. Maybe it feels like you need supernatural CPR to bring you back to life. But I wanna declare, God is not finished with you yet. He never gives up. And right now, I believe He's breathing His life, His air into your lungs, beating your hearts with His fist and saying, believe, believe I'm coming and I will get you out. Let's stand and let's worship together. Listen to me. 
God uses unlikely people, and God never gives up. Jesus is God's rescue plan, always has been. Maybe today you feel like you need to be rescued, and I, I just want to tell you, God is pursuing you even now. On your way out today, our care room will be open. We would love for you to stop by so we can pray with you, or maybe connect you with some resources that can be helpful for you. Thank you so much for being here. We're really glad you're with us. Don't forget Backstage Pass is happening right now. You can meet down here in the front of the auditorium. We'd love for you to join us on that. And we would love to see you back here next week for week two of God in the Movies. Have a great day. Have a great day. Thank you.